So I'll begin by letting you know a little bit about Mural Roots, the host of this panel. It is a nonprofit art organization dedicated to the education, inspiration, and creation of public art and art murals. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Uh, you can also sign up for our, our newsletter. And, uh, and if you are a practicing muralist or artist, you can become a member and create an artist profile on our website and receive many other benefits through our membership. And now, firstly, I would like to thank our panelists for being generous with their time and sharing their expertise with everyone today. We are grateful that you have made time to share with the mural community about your experiences during these uncertain times. I'll introduce the panelists. Uh, we have Javed Jock, who is a street artist and an industrial designer based in Toronto. His art practice migrates between public art murals contemporary architecture and industrial design. He explores how marginal identities, particularly in the graffiti and the Islam communities, impact spatial design. As a member of the XYZ Collective and the Kimmerite Attack Crew, also known as KAC, Jaffet has produced a number of large-scale installations locally and internationally including Canada, the USA, Brazil, Colombia, Switzerland, and Venezuela. Currently, Javed is experimenting with space making via modifying shipping containers, working with Wonder Inc. to design temporary and permanent spaces for the public and private use. Our, uh, another panelist we have is Tara Dory, a visual artist, educator, curator and project manager with a focus on community-based public art. She has coordinated many community-engaged public art programs and projects across the GTA, working with organizations such as Mural Roots, Nuit Blanche, Vibe Arts, East End Arts, The Steps Initiative, Toronto Public Library, and The ROM. While living in, the, in London, UK, she worked at the Royal Museum of Greenwich and participated in the arts programming at Lewis Ham Education Arts Network and Broccoli Art Street Art Festival and Art Mongers. Currently, Tara is collaborating with Lakeshore Arts on the 8th Street Gate Project in South Etobicoke. And finally, we have Andrea Curtis, who is the Director of Operations at the Vancouver Mural Festival and the co-founder of the Transformation Project, which is an events uh, production company. She has experience producing every kind of festival, from street festivals to parades, from field trips to music performances. Her mission is to work with like-minded teams who share, um, who shape cities through celebrations. She believes that our cultural celebrations are practices in building resilient cities. cities. This passion for lifting communities by shining a light on the existing talents within them is clearly illustrated by her work with the Vancouver Mural Festival, now the city's largest free celebration of public art and music. Unfortunately, June Kim is ill today and she will not be able to participate in the panel. We are wishing her a speedy recovery. And um, and now we will begin um, with uh, alternative ways of finding funding for artists during a COVID-19 or a pandemic situation. And Tara is going to offer her presentation that she's prepared for you. All right, hi everyone. I just need Janine, do you know if I have the presenter permissions uh, right now? One second. Let me know if this is working. I see your screen. Okay. All 
right. So I see a lot of familiar names and faces, um, which is great. A lot of you uh, might know me from my role at Mural Roots. Um, I've worked with the organization on and off um, in different capacities since 2012. Um, my first mural in the city was actually, I was an artist assistant on a mural uh, one summer with Mural Roots. Um, so I go pretty far back with the organization. Um, and a lot of my role, similar to what Janine is doing now, was um, working with the programming, uh, making sure that there was increased access for projects and funding and sustainability for artists, emerging artists who wanted to make a practice out of mural making. Um, but like many of us in this conversation, I'm assuming, um, that are working in the arts in the creative field. Um, I juggle a lot of different titles in order to be sustainable and also just to keep myself busy and not feeling bored. Um, so I've had titles of being an artist, an illustrator, an educator, facilitator, uh, project manager, programming coordinator, curator, uh, grant writer, and artist assistant, um, and probably a few others. But Today, what Janine has asked me to, to focus on for this presentation is uh, the different opportunities with funding and support for getting jobs and connections for artists, especially um, this year, which has been a really difficult year uh, for all of us, and myself included. So the first section that I'm going to focus on is grants and project funding. Um, Really, there is a process for this, and you don't want to be leaving this to the last minute. So I've found the best process is hunkering down, researching what's out there, um, deciding what's worth applying for, what makes sense for what you want to do and where your skill level is. Um, give yourself a schedule. Um, I know for myself, especially now that I've been working freelance, I try to give one day a week. Um, where I put everything that's in terms of grant writing, applying for jobs or different projects, I try to do it on Thursdays. So I think that's a good way to keep checking yourself and making sure that you're um, giving yourself a schedule for getting these, uh, the writing done and getting everything done for these uh, grants. Uh, get help. That's a big one. Um, I did want to point out that there are lots of people that are happy to help you brainstorm, write, and edit um, your applications for grants and projects. Um, this is something that one of the ways that I've been making some funds for myself, because I have experience writing grants, I've been helping artists do that, but also the grants officers is what they're called for different grants. It's part of their job to help you as an artist to uh, you know, edit, give you advice, um, give you feedback. So reaching out to the grants officer, um, staff from different arts organizations, um, and think of the friends and the colleagues that are in your field who might have grants and grant writing experience because I think a lot of us are really open to helping each other out, um, giving a second look, giving advice um, for grant writing. Um, also, I wanted to point out that especially because a lot of us don't have the funding, um, you can hire someone to help you, uh, but also I've been open myself to trading for help. So with some artists um, over the winter and the spring, I've traded things like um, shared studio time with an artist because I don't have a studio. So I helped them with some grants and they let me use their studio. I had another artist that I traded they helped me with some Photoshop. Another artist gave me a painting, um, some marketing advice, um, or allowing me to be part of the project if it got accepted. So there are ways, I think, that we can be creative. If you don't have the funds to maybe um, give back for what you're getting for this support, um, I think trading, you can be really creative with what you trade people to support you with the grants too, or with your applications. So I saw that this was one of the questions from someone who had registered um, specifically about groups 
if you are a person of color, if you are an artist with a disability, um, if there are any barriers, if you're an equity seeker, seeking artist, um, there's usually specific grants, mentorships, assistance, and support for you. Um, so specifically in Toronto, we have Toronto Arts Council, TAC. So this is the list of um, equity seeking groups that they have specific programs for and what they identify. Uh, the second line is for Ontario Arts Council and the third line is for what is identified by Canada Council for the Arts. And I'll get more into some details in a few slides. So starting with Toronto Arts Council, and sorry for those of you who are on the call and aren't in Toronto, but I'll try to go pretty quickly through this. You'll see the, uh, the chart that has a few of the deadlines for specific visual art projects. I wanted to bring attention to the fact that in Toronto, in 2021, the mayor and the city have declared the year of public art. So there are specific grants for public art that are, we're now in the phase where you can start brainstorming and thinking of applying for these special grants. So one of them is due September 10th. The other one is due October 1st. So you think about it, we kind of are getting close to those. So those are things that I definitely recommend uh, looking into and start brainstorming. Is there an organization you can connect with or a collective of artists that you have a great idea for um, making happen? Next year is going to be a big year for public art, so uh, those grants are there to, to make more projects happen. So specifically for equity-seeking artists uh, with the Toronto Arts Council grants, um, for artists of color, they ask you to self-identify in all your applications. For Indigenous artists, there is arts project grants, um, grants for deaf artists, artists with disabilities, um, accessibility help, um, and a couple of specific grant programs, mentorship for newcomer and refugee artists. Um, in addition to these groups, Toronto Arts Council also is, is purposefully increasing access um, to artists that are working outside the downtown core, um, newcomer and refugee artists, and young and emerging artists, which usually uh, I think they label as 18 to 30. So for Ontario Arts Council, um, again, a few grants in the visual arts um, section that I've put down there. Um, sometimes they have a couple deadlines in the year that you should just be aware of. Um, just keep checking the website and they will have the specific dates um, soon probably. And then again, for artists, if you are in an equity seeking uh, group or identify as any of these groups, um, you can see on the list that there's uh, quite a few specific um, grants, whether it's for creating art or for career development, mentorship, um, or assistance with getting these grants, there are um, you know, extra supports there and on the website. So the final tier uh, that I have to talk about today is the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, they have rolling deadlines. Uh, so that just means you can apply any time of the year. You just want to keep in mind that it takes a couple of months to get the approval for the grant. So if you have a project timeline, make sure you're applying quite a few months uh, before that. Um, and their website is really great to navigate and a lot of different ways that artists can uh, get funding wherever they are in their practice. Um, well, yeah, one note I had for Canada Council for the Arts is that you have to create an account and submit a profile for validation 30 days before you want to apply. So again, like thinking through uh, giving yourself extra time, you need those extra 30 days before you can even apply um, if, you if you don't have a, a profile yet. Um, and then for Canada Council for the Arts, um, for equity seeking artists, um, again, they have specific grants, um, indigenous artists for application assistance for artists who are deaf or artists with disabilities, 
um, and also some professional development um, and specific grants for new and early career artists. Um, so those are those are the government grant levels that we have available to us. Um, I wanted to then talk about project grants um, coming from the city and the art service organizations. Um, again, sorry for those of you that aren't in Toronto, but probably whatever we have in Toronto, you it's likely that you have something similar in your city. Um, so most of you have probably heard of Street Art Toronto, um, ways that you could get your name out and get potential projects. Uh, definitely follow them, sign up for the newsletter uh, on social media. You can create an artist profile on their for, for their website. Um, and I think a couple times a year they have uh, a request for expressions of interest where you can fill out an application and just be on a roster for them and they know what kinds of work you're looking for. Um, of course, there's mural roots, and Janine was talking about following mural roots, uh, following the newsletter. Um, I think it's great to, if you can, become a member and create a profile for the website. Um, I remember when I worked for mural roots, a lot of businesses would call into the organization looking for an artist, and we would send them straight to the membership profiles where they could just browse and choose an artist from there. And then also you get mural opportunities, jobs, straight to your email if you're on the membership list. Um, another great uh, art service organization uh, that's in Toronto is called Neighborhood Arts Network. Um, they also have a newsletter. Um, you can become a member for free, create a profile, and they have um, news and opportunities, job posts. Um, and the last um, section of art service organizations um, the city has an arts and culture department and um, they have local art service organizations, um, which include Scarborough Arts, East End Arts, North York Arts, Urban Arts, Arts Etobicoke and Lakeshore Arts. Um, and they uh, really push and get out opportunities for artists, um, whether it's mentorship, skill building, um, sharing opportunities, um, they all, all of those groups have really great communications and um, as much as you can follow them, that's really where a lot of the opportunities um, get sent out. Um, also Toronto based, um, the projects and supports uh, are organizations that are specific to um, different groups of equity seeking artists. Um, for example, there's NIA Center for the Arts. Um, that's specifically for artists from across uh, the African di diaspora. Um, there's Tangled Arts and Disability um, for artists with disabilities. There's SAVAC, South Asian Visual Arts Center, um, La Cap, Latin American Canadian Art Projects. And I know there's more. Um, so if you are part of a group um, that's facing barriers, it's likely that um, hopefully there is a group that you can get connected with that specifically is there to serve uh, you and, and help um, with opportunities um, and get you more connected. So in terms of projects and just art gigs in general, um, there's some great art job boards and listings for the arts that are um, across Canada. So working culture is one. Um, you can filter the city you're looking in and the type of job. Um, a lot of organizations um, post positions there. Um, Akimbo is great for anything art listings related. Um, art Bridges focuses more on community engaged arts, but their website um, has a map function. So wherever you are, you can zoom in and you can even see which organizations are close to where you live or in the city where you are. Um, very easy to use and navigate their website and they have uh, classifieds that have jobs and opportunities as well. Um, and then a, a fairly simple arts listing um, that if you sign up will come to your email every two weeks is called Instant Coffee. Um, 
and it ranges. There are listings for art shows, but also arts jobs, mural jobs, anything kind of in that um, scope, they uh, send out every two weeks. So signing up for that is free. So all of these things can be great ways to, you know, stay connected and see what opportunities are out there. And then I think this is my last slide, second last slide, um, is working by commission. And I was hoping that June was going to be here tonight because that really is more of her um, forte and what she's been doing. Um, cold calling local businesses and organizations, um, seeing if they want a mural, whether it's um, inside their space, on their garage, um, for alleyways. Um, it really is just having the confidence um, and the action, being action oriented to just go out there and, and ask. Um, in Toronto, we're lucky that we have um, a number of BIAs, business improvement areas. Um, they get funding from the city and they, uh, part of their mandate is to enhance the public spaces in their neighborhood. So a lot of mural projects happen uh, through the BIAs. Um, and specifically from COVID, I've seen and known a couple of artists who have worked with BIAs to um, help with wayfinding and distancing murals for COVID, um, putting little uh, stencils or, or pieces that indicate on the, on the concrete, on the sidewalks, how far people could, should stay away or um, anything else that kind of helps people navigate now that we're all trying to um, be really careful with the space in these public spaces. Um, and yeah, I think these kind of ideas are great and they're creative ways to, for artists to um, take advantage of what's happening and, and turn something creative that's useful out of it. Um, definitely with the, with when businesses were, had the hoarding or the, the boarding up of their windows, those were opportunities for artists to paint as well. But I think really it comes down to just um, making sure you find the right person to talk to and just being bold and asking to do that. Um, and then the last slide that I have around um, funding, finding funding for yourself um, is pivoting things online. Um, so I found this research project that was done in the last couple of months um, called Community Arts Canopy, and it surveyed uh, a number of artists, um, community members, arts workers, um, to see how we were all dealing with COVID and with all the changes. And this slide specifically asked about how programming has worked. And the highest um, highlight was online workshops and classes. Um, and the second was live streaming. So, I've noticed a few organizations, a lot of organizations. Um, I work for Vibe Arts and I've been doing some uh, online workshops with them, programming with them. Um, the different local art service organizations are doing online workshops. Galleries are doing it. Um, as an artist, if you, can, if you are comfortable um, being a facilitator, teaching, um, that can be a really great source of income. Um, there's also websites like Skillshare. I have some friends who um, are instructors on Skillshare who make a fee from every course that they create and teach and from uh, the number of people that take the courses that they upload. Um, and then lastly, individual parents are also looking for anything really to give their kids something to do, something to be engaged with. So um, if you know parents, if you want to use um, your networks to reach out and see if, you know, you could do some online um, art instruction, be an art tutor, um, maybe for high school age kids, there are, um, there definitely is a need there, I think. And um, it's it definitely is not my favorite thing to, to be digital instead of in person, but there really is a need and a want for artists to be 
um, teaching and sharing and live streaming um, because that's really the way that a lot of us are, are connecting now. So um, that was my last slide. So that was my final point. I think that's a really good point too because <clears throat> I find like with with the online programming too, it does remove some of the barriers of how you would get to a class. Yeah, yeah. It does have some barriers incorporated into it, but like I know for me as a mom, like if I can just go to an online class in my home, I don't have to worry about commuting or finding daycare or anything. So it removes some of those barriers too. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, Andrea or Jaffet, did you have anything that you would like to add to Sarah's presentation? Um, no, I think that was a great overview, Tara. Thanks for that. And there's a lot of resources. Hopefully, some people took some screen grabs, or maybe I will. I'll send the presentation to Janine too. Yeah, and I can share it. That's great. Yeah, it was very, very good. Very good layover of everything. So now, Javed, we'll ask you to share from your experience during the COVID-19 pandemic and, um, and yeah, and how it's affected your mural art practice. Well, I think much like Tara, um, if you're creative, you probably wear a lot of hats. Like if you're doing murals in Canada, at least on the East Coast, that means you probably have seasonal hats. So, uh, I mean, unless a lot of, I don't know, growing up or when I first started my career, maybe 15, 18 years ago, you're either a bartender and a painter or a community mentor and a painter or somewhere in between you had to have a nine to five or you really want to pay your bills unless, you know, your parents are the ones hooking you up. So, um, Personally, because I have my, uh, my other things going on besides the murals, um, from um, private artwork to public artwork, commissions, larger commission than in the world of architecture, it didn't affect me so negatively at first. Uh, I think Louis Blanche was the first one to go kind of wayward, where um, they, they were unsure of it, and just maybe only a couple weeks ago, they said. Louis Blanche will only be virtual, and so our uh, projects that were awarded will be going next year. So one of my installations got pushed. But I think that, um, like, I don't want to uh, undermine, like, what it means to have a voice as an artist. Like, if you, we've been going through COVID and then Black Lives Matter, and it affects a lot of people emotionally. It's not just about, you know, where you get your money from. It's like, where are you, what are you doing to deal with deal with the stress or emotions or anxiety or loneliness that you're dealing with. It's much more than just making a living for me, in my, in my perspective. So um, for some artists at first, it was a lot about skills development, like go deep into skills that you want to acquire. And in the mural game, you know, that's, that's hard to say for some people if they're not, let's say, inclined towards graffiti, then they're not going out and painting without permission and kind of getting up and doing things where they can they can develop the skill, then yeah, it might be harder, but maybe it's time, you know, I, I don't know if there's one international successful mural artist who doesn't have a fine arts practice. I mean, almost every successful international artist probably has uh, work for the gallery or prints or is making other types of work. So I, I don't know if, you know, you should just limit, limit yourself to murals. Probably nobody does, but we shouldn't frame the discussion as just being about mural projects. It's definitely an opportunity to develop your own work, set up your online shop or whatever it might be to develop, um, develop your practice. Um, I think um, for me uh, at first, um, we, we were lucky, not lucky, but um, some of the projects that we're working on were clients did not pull their money. So we're able to like continue. And I actually, um, I went straight to Canada Council of Arts to their, uh, um, I think it's from creation to concept to realization program. 
And actually, I went for their biggest one. I think it was 100K they were offering. And just wrote that right away as soon as COVID hit. Because it's an online, as Tara mentioned, it's online. Uh, ongoing deadline. So, um, you know, I think I, I went, my first inclination was like, how can I propose artworks that are COVID friendly? Like, why, why not I be part of the strategy? Because at the end of the day, I feel like cities are going to look towards creativity to heal. Um, probably as Andrea knows best with what she's been organizing in Vancouver. We haven't quite done it as well in, in Toronto, I feel like, like the, the COVID murals, the thank you murals. But uh, we saw what they were doing in Vancouver. But I think that this idea of how do you design an art installation or project that is that embraces social distancing? Like what does that mean to still bring people together, still practice that? Like, can you be ahead of the game? Because, you know, I don't know when a vaccine is going to be available and people are still going to want to congregate you know, and wear masks or gloves or whatever they need to do. What does it mean to develop that? So that was where my head went to. And, um, you know, I work with a small team of artists and we kind of brainstormed on um, on an installation where people could go and we looked at augmented reality. We were really interested in what that could do for people. And people, you know, that's something we've been playing with for a number of years where you go to the mural, you open up your phone, you run a, your camera through it and content comes out of the mural um, you, you can put up 3D models, video, watch a time lapse of how it's done so that it's not, it's still, people aren't just stuck at home, you know, you're creating content. And, and a lot of this, for me, a lot of this comes from like doing with nothing. Like I, I'm not waiting for money to do. I know a lot of people can't, maybe can't do that or have different things. But I think that if you are into the mural game, your passion for contributing to public space has to be greater then the bottom line you're trying to meet, you're not a, like every other business. You know, you're just not. You can do all the numbers and planning as you want, but if it's not in your heart, then, you know, going out there and putting yourself up on a wall uh, illegally, legally, through grant writing, whatever, maybe it takes a lot out of you and you might not make it back on the bottom line. You know, that's, that's just my perspective, I'm just being real about that. So yeah, it was grant writing and then um, fishing out for uh, public artworks that weren't just murals um, because if you take a close look like a city like Toronto has a fest five festivals every weekend during the summer that are all canceled that's a whole lump sum of money that still has to be allocated so I went I cold called a whole bunch of festivals and said what are you guys doing with this money like what's going to happen is there a way to reallocate towards some sort of art installations um, and uh, you know, so I knocked on a bunch of doors. Um, Artscape had a call for a number of public artworks uh, with the Lakeview Village project in the West End. I was a finalist for one, I didn't get chosen, but came up with something. Um, and then Union Station hit me up and again, they, they had their festival scrapped for, uh, you know, they do a pop-up shop in the summer at Union Station on Front Street. And uh, they, they, you know, they couldn't do it because of COVID. So they reallocated fund, funds to something called a passive exhibit. So that means no seating, no art show, but a boardwalk with green spaces, inviting people to hang out. And so I'm working on that commission right now where I'm creating seven large scale pieces and seven circles. <clears throat> and um, that opens up like the first week of August. This is kind of a hybrid between mural and uh, panels public art exhibitions and then this experiential not quite immersive that word gets thrown around too easily probably but um so i found that i found that i mean we're used to it i don't i think we're used to it we're used to being resilient and hustling and having to work from home i don't think these things are too different than covid but i would say that while covid was challenging black lives matter really pushed a number of artists into a completely different headspace, which is that we can no longer wait for funding. We can no longer shut up about what's going on. We have to, we have to go out there and do something. And uh, so I, you know, I got to give kudos to to Fade and Moises Frank, who organized Paint the City Black on the in the Queen Street alleys, where like 40 artists came together and and, and killed those walls and really, you know, show the solidarity among street art graffiti community for Black Lives Matter. 
And then, you know, we also um, Danilo Deluxo, Romana Kassam, and a DMB, also known as Young Yemi, <clears throat> where we got a permit to close down Augusta on Kensington Market and wrote Black Lives Matter on the street. 16 letters, 16 artists, and no, no money. Both of those, zero money. It's just every art, and no artist asks for money. No, nobody said, yeah, I got, I'm going to bring my paint. I'm going to be there. I'm going to help prime. You know, and I think that that's the beauty of this uncertain times has really brought people together uh, to understand that we have a bond and we have to stand up for each other and that, uh, you know, the, the industry or where money is coming from is not going to dictate the quality or the voice of the community. It shouldn't. It can't. I mean, it can only help. Hopefully it does. You know, we, we don't have the fortunes of down south. I feel that uh, painting in America, there's a lot more investment in uh, the mural arts from the private sector than we do have in Canada. It's slowly opening up, but and Street Art Toronto's done a lot in terms of public money. But um, I would say that, say that, I mean, the biggest thing, in, if I'm going to talk about murals in the time of COVID, is just going out there and uh, against all odds and, and, you know, putting your work out as you can, you know, and for a lot of people I know as muralists, like, you know, there's a lot of organization that goes inside a mural, but people who are in the graffiti community, they don't really, sometimes they're not looking at it from that angle. They're looking at it as like, I don't really have to ask for permission. I'm going to rather ask for forgiveness. Actually, no one in graffiti is going to ask for forgiveness to so scratch that. <laughs> but um, that's, that's, uh, I think that's really all I can share right now. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think um, I think it's incredible how fast um, uh, uh, Moises, Frank, and um, Yummy were able to react to the situation. Like, I feel like it was, um, yeah, just so quick. And like that, you said that they did it without any money. It's just a really incredible project. So, um, yeah, definitely they deserve some um, deserve some props. And um, and then yeah, I really uh, like the like ingenuity that you've expressed in like how you know you just like you thought of like money where it's not being spent now because of COVID, and that you just like banged on doors, and that's uh, you know um, yeah, really ingenuitive, and like you can see like you know why you're so successful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean it, it just goes off. It just piggybacking what Tara said, where you have to go and. Go out there and do it, but I feel like everyone on this thing, you know, if they're associated with the mural world, gets that. I don't think that's new. Uh, yeah. I think maybe it's just not always depending on that, like going out and, and, and doing it yourself. And but I would really say that developing other skills related to it, you, like you know, if you if you can't go out, so many other skills. We have to be graphic designers, photographers. You know, maybe start 3D modeling, rendering. There's so many other avenues connected to the mural art that I feel like mural sometimes limited us just to just painting on exterior walls. When it's it's really a much more diverse field than that. Yeah. Um, Tara and Andrea, did you have anything that you'd like to add to this? Um, my uh, my brain is buzzing. Like there's a lot, <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna save it for um, when it starts to come out of me when I give my piece. So I'll hold it for a moment. Mm -hmm. And Tara. Okay. Going off oh. mute. No, I I just oh. yeah I appreciate. I always like hearing Javid talk because everything's so genuine when it mm -hmm. comes from you. I just always know it's coming from the heart and. Um, it just reminds me too of how important it is to be around other artists and be like exchanging our energies. Um, yeah, and like I, I am jealous, Javid, that like you have this crew of yours. Um, <laughs> even though I have artists who are friends, but like this idea of, and it, it's more, from my understanding, is like more in the graffiti community, but like to have these crews is like, that's so essential. Yeah, I, I, I do think I'm, I'm blessed to be in that, but I feel that for, I mean, I, I don't know, I think it happens a little bit more organically, um, maybe because of, you know, we were in the generation pre-internet where you mm -hmm. had to meet people.
people would go to the paint shop and hang out with the black folk and see other people's work or, you know, and like, we don't have, I can't Instagram message you and say, hey, I like your work. Can I paint with you? You can do that now. So I would almost assume that more people could find ways to work with each other. But there's yeah. something about, you know, seeing people repeated times and that striking up a conversation that makes a bond. Because sometimes the bond is not just about working together. It's like you create a friendship with somebody, you share some kind of history with them or like heritage or, you know, whatever it might be. Other interests besides mural art that bring them together. Um, but I don't think, like, especially when you're painting large, how can, you can't all, I never paint a large mural by myself. There's always bringing other artists and it's going to help me execute. Like, it's, it's, it's never a, a solo mission when it's a certain scale, and even when it's not. So I think, um, I don't know, I, I hope that uh, other artists, I feel that a lot of other artists are working in tandem, working with the same amount of crews, like, in, um, uh, come, you know, I think families develop. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And now we'll move on to Andrea. Um, can you tell us a bit about the partnerships that you formed at the beginning of the pandemic? The Gas Town and the Make Art Well Apart projects were some of the first mural responses we saw when the pandemic hit. How were you able to react so quickly to the situation and what was that experience like? Um, hi, thank you for that question. Um, I just want to do a quick tech check. Is everybody yeah. hearing okay? I was getting a bit of a buzz, but I can handle it if that, it was just me. Is everybody hearing okay? It sounds fine to me on this end now. I did get that buzz, but it's gone now for me as well. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for the question. Thank you so much for having me uh, on the panel today. We're really grateful to be able to speak to you from uh, the West Coast, and it's really a, a blessing to get to learn a little bit more about what's going on over in Ontario. Um, so hi, everybody from Vancouver. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm uh, I'm broadcasting to you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish nations. Um, we work a lot with the three local nations. It's a big part of what we do. Um, obviously, mural art, we have an opportunity um, to really think about um, visual culture and who who gets visibility, and force ourselves into public spaces with the um, with this two D medium. So uh, yeah, I want to I'm, I'm going to start getting into your questions. Basically, what um, I wanted to start with a little bit about who we are. I'm not sure um, all yeah, of the people know, know much about the Vancouver Mural Festival. We started out in 2016, um, it, essentially as a response to the fact that so many cities across Canada, Montreal, Toronto, across the world, in fact, I mean, you go to Montreal, I should know, like you can go to Melbourne or Berlin, and you're going to see art in the streets. Um, and it's just something we didn't have in Vancouver. Vancouver really loves rules. Uh, we really love clean, shiny buildings, and so um, in order to in order to showcase the talent that's in our city, this is we started the festival. So um, we've been operating with a really um, active, impressive team of producers, fundraisers, artists. There's three of us um, in the leadership of of the mural festival, and then we have about five. Um, full time and then maybe about another 20, 25 seasonal staff. And um, so it really balloons in the summertime during mural season. Um, so when COVID hit, um, we had just moved into our brand new office um, and all of a sudden we were, we were facing this moment like everybody else across the country, across the world, it's time to, it's, it's time to react, it's time to fold down. A lot of my personal reactions were really, um, they were fight. That's it. That's kind of my. That's kind of my zone. I was like, we've got to fight through this. We've got to go. I've since, like, you know, have done a lot of work to find. Actually, you know, it's it's the patience. It's the time. It's to respond. The hustle is so important. Um, but it took some time to just like relax into it and say, what are what are we good at? What are we best at? What do we do? What what is what is this all about um, to us? And what do we bring to the world? And so it was this moment that. Um, 
there was uh, there's a, a mailing list that I subscribe to that puts out um, information about uh, new buildings and developments that are going up around the city, kind of like an architectural nerd um, website uh, and blog. And the guy had gone out and taken photos of this like incredibly apocalyptic looking downtown Vancouver and all of these boarded up windows. And it was, I mean, it was beyond anything we'd ever seen. It was, it was the strangest thing um, to just watch our city turn into this, like, uh, I mean, it just looked like a pandemic war zone. Um, and so the moment that we saw these blank um, plywood walls, we said, this is us, this is what we do, but that's art space. You know, it makes me think a little bit of Javid's hustle. It's like, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not about, there's a balance between money um, and, and just make art, you know? And that was, was one of those moments for us where it's like, let's go make art, you know? Let's, let's do it. That's the most important piece. Let's go figure this out. Um, and and the, the interesting thing, I really love, uh, you know, having Tara and then Javid speak because to me, it was like a really, like it was really getting me fired on um, the balance that we have to find in terms of what, what are the rules um, you know, what, what is, what is Canada Council, the Toronto Arts Council, like, what do they have? What are they putting out? What are the offerings? Where's the money? What's the schedule? How do I get it? How do I write that grant? You know, like all of those things mixed with, you know, kind of that street art aesthetic of like, just get a bloody spray can and go and do something awesome somewhere. I like it's, it, and so finding that balance is, is, is great because I'm, I, I'm more, I come from a visual arts background, but my strength is go find that money, go and fund these projects, figure out how it's going to happen, um, go and get that, the public funds, who are the partners, how do we be strategic about it? Because um, we're not doing the art ourselves. I'm not speaking to you as an artist. I speak to you as somebody who takes it very, very seriously um, in terms of making sure artists are paid and compensated for their work. So we don't ask artists to do anything uncompensated. And so um, the moment we saw that, those empty plywood boards all over the downtown core, we called up the Downtown Business Association. We have a uh, longstanding relationships in the last, the, the way we, we've been developing, but in, over the last five years of the work we've been doing and um, working with those BIAs. And I saw that in Tara's presentation. That's really key for us in Vancouver. And it looks like it is for you guys out there, at least as well. They're, they're instrumental. I mean, annually, um, they have operations budgets that are, um, that are for neighborhood beautification, for community engagement projects and um, and so we tap into that and we help connect what's going on in the neighborhoods with artists and with community members and community groups and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, transform the neighborhoods with, you know, with some, some color. Um, it was just kind of anti Vancouver aesthetic. We're changing what that means out here. Um, so effectively we went to the downtown business association and we said, Hey, we want, we want cash and for artists. Uh, to paint on all of these boarded up uh, storefronts and you guys have access to all of the um, the uh, business owners. Um, so they put us in touch with the business owners. We coordinated um, over 60 murals rolled out in about two weeks, two and a half weeks. Um, Van City, our local credit union came on board and offered money for the project as well. Every artist was compensated for the work that they did. Uh, and the city came on board and kicked in funds for all the paint as well. So everything just came together so quickly and it wouldn't have come together that way if we hadn't been building these relationships from the beginning. And so we were really, really lucky to be poised in that respect to have those, um, to have those relationships going already. Uh, and also to have the artist lists to have had all these people apply to our festival over the years, to have our curator who's working um, deeply in the artist community, always watching for up and coming artists. So we knew who um, of the up and coming artists we could trust to put on walls like this, who would need support, and then also who some of the season muralists are. Um, I think this is an interesting moment for me to make a point about um, diversity and what that means for us, especially in this um, you know, post George Floyd, Black Lives Matter moment. Um, we're always really grateful to have some of these these moments flare up as they as they do and will and will continue to until we until we get it right, um, whatever that means. But um, what we what we thought what we noticed when we first started doing murals was that um, you really start to see this thing and you start to pay attention is that murals across the city uh, what they used to look like in Vancouver would be there's like 
a mural, there'd be one mural. And in order to um, satisfy everybody and make everybody happy, we would try to pet, put all of the elements of di diversity into this like Noah's Ark of a mural to represent all the people and all the issues and all the communities. And so you'd have this one mural probably painted by a white guy and it'd be like just all that stuff, right, in it. So our approach is do many murals with diverse artists. And we don't dictate to the artists what to do. We, we stand in between the artist and the, and the commissioner, the commissioning body, the business, whatever it is. And we, we work really hard to make sure the artists represent artistic freedom in, in the work they're doing. And um, the Make Art Well Apart, um, I don't know if I mentioned that's what we call it. That's the hashtag, actually. There you go. There's the link to our blog. Um, so all of those pieces that we did with Make Art Well Apart, um, the artists really had a, a lot of artistic license and freedom to do all of that. Um, you mentioned Gastown. Uh, Gastown, uh, it was so cool because we came up with this idea. We started talking to the BIAs. We had, we had paint on the wall probably within 10 days of speaking to the business associations. Um, within that 10 day period, Gastown popped up. And there was, there was some artists who took initiative and just went on their own, you know, kind of again, to what Javid was speaking to. They just went and did it. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about waiting. It wasn't about anything except for this is our time now. Like, this is what we do. Let's go for it. Um, and so we, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a really great opportunity for us to highlight the work that they were doing. And just what I want to, you know, note that that was them. That was their hustle. They did that. And then um, the Gastown BIA took on a lot of that themselves in funding the artists to do some more of that work. Um, so if, essentially, we did about 60 pieces. Gastown did another, I don't know, 10 or so, 15. Um, and so after all of that, I mean, the response from Vancouver was huge. You know, it was really one of those moments that, I mean, you guys noticed it. That's awesome. Like, it was noticed across the country. Um, it was a really incredible moment for all of us. Um, not just for us as an organization, where obviously selfishly, I'm like, yeah, 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 that's what I want. I want to be able to continue to do this work. I want to make it big. I want to find these opportunities for artists. But um, more than anything, this is culture on a pedestal, finally. You asked the question about, do we feel like cultural first responders? I mean, I hadn't thought about it before, but it's a really interesting framework. It's a really interesting thing um, to think about because it, it makes me think about, you know, these crisis moments are often opportunities for seeing what's important. And those important things are things that are baselines. They're, they're continuously operating. Art is happening. You know, we're making sure that our children get um, art education. We fight for funding in, in public schools. We fight for funding in public art commissions. We, we're, we're hustling for grants. We're, we know this is important. We do it all the time. Like, this is it. It's just really cool to get one of those moments to sit back and say, wow, the world just noticed. You know, they, like, they, they really just got a moment to say, Wow, this is what it feels like when our downtown goes from this po pandemic apocalyptic looking boarded up um, desolate space to this outdoor gallery that showcases who we are now. It's it was that moment. That was super cool. So however we want to frame it, um, cultural first responder is fun. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we're you know, the same thing with with frontline workers, you know, how, how much appreciation do we give? to the grocery store clerks, to the nurses, et cetera. This is a moment for remembering what's important. And so um, that's been a big deal for us. And, and that's something that you know I'm carrying with me. Um, it feels like in a lot of ways, we're being shaken down to our core and rem like remembering um, what the hustle is all about uh, while we're using it, you know? Like that's, it's one of our tools, you know? Um, yeah, it's time for creativity and hustle. That's what, that's what this moment is all about. Um, yeah, so I think before I start going on tangents, like, is did I did I catch everything there? You know, I'm just kind of like let it out. Yeah, no, that was really great. Um, and then the only other thing I would maybe encourage you to talk about is um, the um, Vancouver Mural Fest that's coming up. Right? Is it it's still the B? Thank you. So obviously. Um, so normally what our festival is, is a 10 day festival of um, artist talks, curatorial talks. We do an art show every year. Um, we have all kinds of events, music, et cetera. And it all culminates in this one big day. About 150,000 people come out to the festival. We shut down the streets. It's about 
15 square blocks um, of murals. So we, we focus a lot of the murals on walking routes. And so we've done over, oh, about, we've done over 200 in the last five years. Um, and so uh, you can walk through alleys and, and they're, they're all kind of connected. So you can, you can take yourself on a little bit of a tour. So whenever any of you are out in Vancouver, um, we now have an app. We were very, very, very fortunate to have been gifted with um, a grant from the Canada Council Digital Strategy Fund, which I applied for before we ever knew this pandemic world. Um, and we were lucky, lucky to be awarded that in February, just before the pandemic hit. So we've been actually working on synthesizing all of the data of 200 plus murals into our app over the last few months. And so it really gave us this opportunity in this moment to be able to showcase the work we've done and the work we're doing with being able to create um, a mobile friendly device, uh, a map that people can have on their own devices so they can walk through the neighborhoods by themselves in their pods. And so the festival is very much about this. So I've been calling it the flatten the festival curve. So instead of 10 days of festival where you have 150,000 people show up in that one day, we've taken the festival and spread it out over three weeks. Obviously there's no big street party, but what we are doing is we're doing our curator talks online. Um, all of this was just released actually the other day, Tuesday. So if you go to vanmuralfest.ca at that link that I just posted, you'll find a little bit more information. We're not doing a ton of digital programming. It's something that I felt a bit a little bit burnt out on. Um, it's not so, it's not a space I wanted to get into too much. Um, we're doing a little bit of it, but more more than anything, what we're doing is um, well, what I haven't said yet is we found ourselves in a space where um, because of the Make Art Well Apart moment, there was there was enough recognition um, from neighborhoods across Vancouver, um, particularly amongst um, you know business associations, where they realized actually this is something that they wanted in their neighborhood. They realized and understood the value of art and what it could do for um, public sentiment and a sense of well-being and getting people outdoors. And, you know, it's just a really good place for them to repurpose their funds, <laughs> like according to them and us. So we're doing 60 murals. We're doing it now. It's happening now. We have got production teams on the ground. We'll be painting from now until the beginning and middle of September. The festival is now August 18th until September the 5th, 7th, 7th, sorry. And um, and so yeah, it's sixty murals over those next few days or those those few weeks, while uh, we'll be encouraging Vancouverites to get out, use the app, explore their neighborhoods. We've got media partnerships um, to help people like you know find like ten best things in Marpool or in Collingwood or neighborhoods they never really would think to go and visit. Um, and there's a lot to discover. And I think murals, in a lot of ways, they're our two D Trojan horse. They're the way that we have we, we kind of open doors into these spaces where whether it's hey get outside and go for a walk and check out the murals last year we actually did a run the murals uh tie up with mac with mountain equipment co-op which was i don't know if this is just a vancouver thing but everybody wanted to run the murals it was unbelievable how successful it was um who knew artists and runners all in the same space um but uh yeah, so there's um yeah, so back to the yeah, the, the Trojan horse piece, like the the public issues that we get to tackle um using murals is super, super cool. We're talking about project we're working on projects right now with different community groups. Um just I guess one teaser. Um we were doing one mural this year and hopefully a lot next year, um, with the Hogan's Alley Society. You guys probably won't know what that is because a lot of Vancouverites don't. Hogan's Alley is a neighborhood that was destroyed by um, a development overpass um, in Chinatown area, just outside of downtown. Um, and it was the home to Vancouver's black community. And that community was destroyed. Jimi Hendrix lived there for a while with his grandmother. The community was absolutely obliterated. And um, some of the Chinatown residents were able to stop the entire project, but a lot of it went through completely obliterated that black community. They were, they were sent all over the city. So we don't actually have an area in Vancouver that is like the black hub, um, or the black neighborhood. Um, and so you don't actually feel that presence that you, you do in a lot of other Canadian cities. And so we're really, really excited to be able to 
outside of all of these big development visions and there's, there's groups working on housing projects and all kinds of legacy pieces that are going to take years and years to do. But we have this opportunity to do this 2D work where we get to work with people from the Token Valley Society and say, let's bring visibility of black artists back to this neighborhood now. And there's just paint like tens of thousands of square feet. I'm not, I haven't checked out enough about um, much of the uh, paint the city black, but it's, it's like that kind of thing, you know, like this is the, our ability to get out there and make an impact and bring visual, um, visibility and visual sovereignty to groups that are um, the groups that are like, constantly marginalized in public spaces. And so that's a really big part of what we do. Um, it, it's the fire um, that, that gets us to do it. I mean, it's the fire that gets me through slogging through um, endless hours of grant applications and reporting. <laughs> um, but you know, that's the back end. That's the, that's the below the iceberg, you know, work um, all, of, all of the legal and the logistical and the admin. So, um, so yeah, there it is. That's the exciting stuff that we get to work on. The festival's going ahead. I feel like the last festival standing right now. Couldn't do it without this incredible team. It feels like an absolute blessing to be able to um, work with marginalized groups, pour money into their projects, bring visibility to their projects, employ our team right now. Um, it would be in this not to give um, credit to the Canadian government and how we've, we've been supported in this time. I would not be able to do it without federal subsidies. Um, I've been taking advantage of every support program that's available to us, and I just feel like everything we do right now, event planning or mural planning or whatever programming it is, is like, it's like next level. It, like, we are doing like a pop-up event. I guess we're in a bit of a different situation than you guys are um, in terms of COVID. And so we, um, we are allowed to do a little bit of public programming and we're, we're outside a bit, but everything just feels like event planning on steroids. You know, there's just so many considerations. Um, and so we've been incredibly busy. It's been it's been a pretty wild time. So thanks for um, thanks for letting me get to talk about it. I feel really yeah. Good. Thank you for talking about it. It sounds incredible. It it's it's uh, that it is incredible how many murals you guys have um, managed to accomplish in such a short period of time. And with um, you know uh, and yeah, just to react so quickly. Um, we were super impressed here at Mural Roots and um, really wanted to have you on and talk about um, your quick responses to the pandemic and, you know, the, the uncertain times of today. So thank you so much. Um, there was a question in the chat that came up and they were wondering if you accept um, artists from outside of Vancouver. Yeah, I can see that. So um, yes, we we actually bring in artists. We we usually bring in about um, twenty five ish percent of international artists or artists from around Canada. Uh, obviously, we kind of we cut off that program this year. We're we're doing no travel. Um, yeah, we do. We 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 try really hard to focus on um, uh, uh, shining the spotlight on Vancouver talent um, because. Vancouverites don't believe it's here. We don't see ourselves as a, as a creative artistic city, but we actually have the highest per capita number of working artists in this city. And so, um, yeah, that's that's our big focus. Most of our muralists have never done a mural before. So we do a lot of training too. But yeah, we love bringing people in um, from outside of the city. I see will the ever, walls ever be painted over? Yeah, it happens all the time. It's I think it's really important to help, um, help people in cities like get used to change, you know, like, Let's have a bit of a revolving gallery. Buildings are come, go up, buildings are go down. Some murals, like I don't like all the pieces. I, I, I'm not expect. I don't expect to, you know. So they get painted over. Some of my favorites get painted over. It's it's it doesn't it doesn't change up that fast. But um, we're we open to it. We only have a commitment with the city of Vancouver to keep the murals up for two years. Okay, so now I'm going to um, open it up to uh, Tara Javid and Andrea to answer these questions. These were questions that came from um, registration. And so the first one is that um, calls for proposal can be very competitive and difficult to get. Um, what, um, what would you suggest for mural opportunities outside of submission calls? Uh, I'm happy to answer that. Javid probably has some thoughts on that too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the uh, we we get a, we put out a, a call for artists every year for 
we usually do anywhere between about 20 to apparently 60 walls this year. Um, but we put out we put a call, out a call for artists. We usually get 800 submissions for 20 walls. So it is incredibly competitive, and um, and it sucks for artists. And and I'm sorry for that. Um, but what I what I notice going through these things, like honestly, more than anything. Wherever it's wherever it's possible, I encourage artists to get on education boards. Um, you know, with it, where it's like community centers or you know granting bodies or whatever it is, because then you get to see it from the other side and you get to see what's coming at you. Because I see a lot of things where you know people um, submit their name for um, for consideration, but their 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 Instagram, for example, will be pictures of their you know their cat or their sandwiches, and it's it doesn't show their art practice. And so we're looking for people that. Um, you know, are, are professional, they're demonstrating art practice, they don't have to have a ton of experience, but they need to show that they get what they're doing. Um, and really, at the end of the day, it's it's consistency. I mean, it's not always the best and brightest and most talented artists that are getting the work. It's 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 the persistence. It really does work. And I, I hate to give away that secret because I don't like getting like the persistent emails. I feel bad when I'm reading them all the time, but eventually uh, it does pay off. It's hustle. Uh, yeah. And Jav yeah, Javid, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, I, I've been rejected by the Vancouver Arts Festival three times now. So <laughs> I don't know what to say about that, but I think um, I, I, I'm not big on blanketing mural artists. Or any artist for that matter, like there's uh, artists at different stages of their career. Some who are hobbyists transitioning, trying to transition. Some who are juggling their nine to five or working from home or whatever it is. Others with children and lots of other responsibilities in their family. Like artists from all walks of life. So I don't know if there is a recipe. Um, and then there's people who are into, you know, producing without. An organized fashion and others who want have to do safety and training and check off all their boxes and their you know the harnesses and wsib et cetera et cetera so um I, is the question really how do i go and make a mural outside of the realm of applications or um is that really what the question is um yeah i guess like i guess it's like Outside, yeah, I guess like outside of our councils, like our submission calls. I mean, for me, it's like, why do you paint murals? Yeah. Like, do you paint murals because you find the gallery limiting and only exposed to a certain audience? So you want to have accessibility to the public? Then are you going out there? Are you only going to paint a mural if there's a budget? Like, what is your voice worth? Like, do you feel your voice is worth more? I mean, do you feel that, I, I think that's what it comes down to. Like, if you really have something to say and you want to put it out there, I don't know who's going to stop you from wanting to do that. If you're waiting for a council or an application process to provide you with that opportunity, then, you know, you might end up with a really uh, boiled down version of what you really wanted to say anyway. Community consultations don't always come out. Like, we don't always have somebody like Andrea who's able to represent an artist to the commissioning body. You know, we've done, I've done murals where, you know, we had 13 people of different businesses. We did a mural in Little India, Toronto. That was over 13 businesses, a church, a mosque, um, a women's domestic violence support center, and it was the whole city block. And the amount of stakeholders diluted what actually got produced on that mural because you had to satisfy everybody so it's like even if you want to go in that route are you really going to achieve what you're trying to do but you know so it, i think it depends on on what your real mission is and, as an artist and how dedicated like how determined you are to realize you know your work in public, public space yeah i think that's a good point as well and then uh we have do you have any expert advice or experience on how to overcome the economic slump or suggestions on ways to follow up with projects or clients during COVID-19? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
Uh, this is, I think it's, it's really hard to remember sometimes when, when the money isn't in our pockets and when we're, when we're hustling for it, but the money is out there. There's always money. It's, it's always, it's like, it just, it exists, you know? It's about like, I'm always finding myself in this place where it's like, okay, is there a grant? Got it. Okay, is there a sponsor? Try for that. Like, what's the way I can get in there? Like, really, it's about figuring out different ways to show up and to go and grab it, you know? Like, I think, I feel like, like, um, like Java and I, like, are saying, you know, kind of similar things in terms of creativity and how you show up, you know, creativity and when you show up and why you're showing up. And so, um, it's it's a it's really thinking laterally about about access, um, and then in terms of following up on commissions, like that, I feel like that's a whole other um, that's a whole other conversation because sometimes I mean I'm just gonna say this first and straight up sometimes like you know people just don't want your art it doesn't it's not it's it's not about you it's not about the the work like maybe it's just they just don't like it maybe they don't like art you know like those we run into it constantly I get rejected all the time when we go looking for walls and it, um, you know, we get like, I don't know, maybe five no's for every yes. Um, and so it's, it's a hustle. So it's, it's nice though, like we kind of do that work. We're the facilitators in order to um, offer the opportunities for the artists so the artists can come and, and, you know, just paint the wall and, you know, find a great, flat, beautiful, um, visible surface. Um, we do a lot of work in order to figure that out. And so you don't see that behind the scenes piece but um, it's important not to get um, too disheartened and, and, and expect notes. Mm. Yeah, the mural roots is um, much the same in the way that they operate too. Like we um, make sure that, you know, there's enough funding to pay an artist before we start a project. And there's a lot of like bureaucracy around it. Um, so, so we're not, we're like, I, like I'm, I, I personally would encourage someone to go out and just paint a wall. But as a mural roots as an organization wants to know that there's funds available to pay artists for the work that they're doing. Some people are better at sales than others. Um, we have the specific salespeople in in my organization. I'm not one of them. I can do it, but I'm not the best, not at all. So we we know who to put out there when we need to do sales. And so um, that's that's why you know as an organization we have that responsibility. Um, and as a public organization, we have that responsibility in order to go get that funding and disperse it to the artists, report on our, our activity, how we spend our time. Um, but it's, I, I know that can be really hard for artists, but that's where collaboration and working in teams is really, really helpful because sometimes you just need to look at your bed, like you've got this skill and I haven't got it, you know? Having that, that, um, that team and that sense of self-awareness in terms of what your, um, your skills are, like Tara was mentioning earlier, like, you know, if you're a strong grant writer and somebody needs help, what can you trade? Yeah. Tara, did you want to um, put anything in or input? Yeah, I was going to say um, back to the first question. Sorry. That, um, yeah, I didn't I didn't get in there in time, but um, yeah, it, it the rejection is hard and it's hard because I've been on a personal note, like applying to a lot of things as a freelancer this, this year as well. And it, it's hard not to take it personally, but because the art is so personal to us and because, you know, I'm assuming we all like, we, like Javid was saying, this, this is something that comes from our heart. We care so much about it. So to have someone not say yes to it, you're, you're going to take it personally. Um, but um, like I said, uh, close to the beginning of my presentation, um, really when you're doing your research of what you're going to apply to, I guess it's like, a, a, like statistics, think about focusing on the ones that really seem aligned with what you do. Once you've figured out, because I think being on the jurying end of, um, of applications and evaluating them, it's very clear sometimes that artists are applying with a very generic application and they're not right for the project. And it almost seems like it was a waste of time for them. But if you can focus on the projects that seem to be aligning with you, um, then hopefully your numbers are gonna go up. Not that you're gonna get everything, but just, just being um, more mindful of, you know, don't apply for just everything or if it's a great, amount of money, but it doesn't align with what you do, it's not worth 
it. Yeah. And then like, uh, like Andrea was saying, um, I think, yeah, like, like, um, pull from your networks, pull from, if you have a connection with, um, someone who works and does grant writing or works from an organization that they can help you and edit, um, or give you some advice, like, don't be shy to reach out because I know the majority of us that work in the arts, like we're happy to help and to trade or just to like, to be part of making things happen. Okay, excellent, thank you. What else do we have here? Um, oh, and so there, there was a question too about um, uncredited art programs in schools. Um, and what are um, some outside of school um, learning that you would suggest? I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's a line between, uh, if, if, like, I don't know where education and art stops each other. And I, I never liked art school. I went and studied philosophy and history. So I was more interested in how Diego Rivera composed, you know, his murals and understanding Marxism and the history of his people and then uh, learning the color wheel and having, you know, a teacher undermine my sensitivity or love of the aesthetic of graffiti. Like, I mean, to each is their own uh, in terms of education. I, I think one thing that I, um, in my years of mentorship of arts, one thing that's important for artists to learn is scale. I feel like a lot of artists, uh, nowadays there's many tools for scaling up your, your work onto a wall. But um, I think it seems like maybe moving up in scale is, a, is an important important thing to do practice how to how to grid and how to project that of course you need a wall to do it but um learning how to use a scale ruler how to um how to project your work to a larger thing and then i would say um i'm biased but i think learning aerosol if you're a brush uh artist and learning brush if you're an aerosol artist like learning how to use those techniques number of years in the past seven years, we go every year down to Colombia to paint because the sensibility of being painted in Venezuela and Mexico and Colombia and uh, the resourcefulness of mural artists to mix aerosols with latexes, to mix aerosol colors within each other using straws, to um, sometimes only having black and white aerosols and having to compose the rest of your work, like learning how to mix multiple mediums to achieve your work, I think that's it's really important. I guess that's very dependent again on access to a wall or going out and painting. Um, but uh, yeah, I think those are the first things that come to head. I'm sure you know that. Oh, you're on mute, Gina. Oh, thank you, David. Um, and then, can I just ask you uh, how? one would go about asking someone for a mentorship opportunity? Yeah, I mean, mentorship can be done in a lot of ways. Like a Toronto Arts Council has a formal program where you can sign up as a visual artist. I've been paired with artists before. You do a grant together and hopefully make a little money or get rejected and try again. Um, not not very optimistic guy today. Um, I, otherwise, I mean, like I said, with, with Instagram being where it is, like I. I get hit up randomly by artists all the time and say, hey, uh, you know, and, and if I meet young artists, I always invite them to come paint and just learn. I, I tell them, you don't get to do much. You might not get to do much with them. You might be just priming or we're just, you know, doing fill in and stuff, but at least you're getting exposed to it. I, I feel like uh, if you're going to be in the mural game, you got to go and put your head out there. And so if you find somebody and you like the style, just hit them up on Instagram and say, hey, like, I, w I would love to work with you, or I'd love to, are you open to me meeting up with you? Or are you open, maybe COVID can't do that, I'm open to Zoom. Are you open to um, having somebody assist you in your next work? Um, and I think mentorship really becomes about two people feeling, you know, feeling comfortable with one another, safe with one another. Like, maybe, you know, 
again, a relationship beyond art. Um, and so it, it always helps to have, uh, I've, been a, I've been a mentor for two or three artists for over seven years now. Uh, and I used to be, you know, more of a youth, like a, a mentorship in a community center or as a drop-in mentor, which really is more just like a youth worker, but where you have relationships that come and go uh, and they could be fast versus where you start to build with somebody and they are growing in their career for a long period of time. Um, but I think also from the artist side, mentorship is really important because you stay fresh. You stay connected to like what is going on with people who you know, are younger from very different backgrounds, different stage in the game and are looking at the game in a very different way. So I think like the best way for mentorship is really the like cold call. Just hit them up with a message. Yeah, it's that hustle again, right? Yeah, definitely. And uh, Tara or Andrea, did you want to input anything to that? Um, regarding mentorship, or I don't know. Um, but uh, I think always, always feeling like go through gut, like look for natural fits. I think mentorship can be really hard. We have these big ideas around like how mentorship should work, like in this kind of formal scenario. I don't know if it's like like you know karate kid legacy or something that's like in our brains like how it's going to work we're going to have this perfect trainer that's going to come out and help us be who we who, like reveal our our true selves um so yeah feel, look, look for look for the natural fit and be be ready to just move on to the next thing and say thank you you know um and tara yeah um back to the um, like education and training informal that you can do. Um, there is so much on YouTube. <laughs> like that's having- That's my thought. I was like, go down a YouTube like rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I, I have been pushing myself like during um, the last few months, especially having extra time to um, like work on some digital skills. So I have the app Procreate and every anything that I want to learn how to do even if I don't know exactly how to word what I want to do I just google it put it into the YouTube search bar and there's so many different artists who I can choose who's the best at explaining it or in the style that I understand so that's that's been a big one um yeah for me I also have been doing some free courses on Coursera that I, re I really have enjoyed yeah, I'm going to do a plug for Mural Roots here, too, that we offer um, <laughs> intro to um, mural arts, and we also offer uh, mural art career development, um, too. So if you're interested in those type of workshops, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter or become a member, and uh, you will receive information about those, um, yeah, those learning opportunities. Membership is fine, Ola. Yeah. Membership. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, there's just one minute left. So, and I um, don't want to run past anyone's time. So, I do want to thank you all for contributing your experience and um, uh, sharing with the group today. Uh, it's been uh, really informative and super energizing, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm I'm going to post my email address in case anybody has any follow-up questions. I'm happy. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Thanks to everybody. Thank you for having me, Andrea. I'll be in Vancouver in two weeks. I'm going to hit you up. You <laughs> okay. Sounds great. Let's go on. A, uh, let's go on a mural walk. Great. Let's do that. Yeah. Sounds good. Cool. No, on a wall, not just a walk. Come on. Okay, I'll find you a wall. <laughs> <laughs> it was good to see Thanks everyone. Thanks, everybody. It was, it was on chat. the screen. All right. Peace. Ciao. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.